I have a deal for you. For the small price of one eye, one hand, or one foot, I can guarantee that you will enter heaven. What do you think? Who are you going to take? Are you going to take me up on my offer? What's wrong? You seem hesitant. You don't seem as excited as I thought you'd be. I think it's a pretty good deal. You have two of each of those things, after all. And just so we're clear, we're talking about eternal life in the perfection of the kingdom of God, face to face with Jesus, freed from all kinds of suffering. That would include the suffering of losing an eye, a foot, or a hand, I'm sure. So if I put it to you that way, do I have any takers? Now, as you've read this part of the Bible before, and you've heard this teaching of Jesus, has this possibility ever entered your mind, this sort of deal? That maybe Jesus, as shocking as his statements are, should be taken literally here. After all, if I really think about it in terms of cost and loss, it's a pretty good deal. What's one eye or one hand or one foot compared to eternity in heaven with God? So if I could guarantee my place in His kingdom, maybe I should take it. But again, this is one of those things that Jesus says, and our first instinct is to find a way to make it not mean what it looks like it means. Surely, He can't mean what He's saying literally. But this is a pattern we observe throughout the Scriptures, especially with Jesus' teaching. When He talks about salvation, the bar gets set often impossibly high. He asks us to do things like be perfect. And today again, He's asking us to do something that we can't do. Now, even if we could do what He asked, as gruesome as it sounds, It does make sense that if that guarantees a place in heaven, it's not a bad deal. But part of what Jesus is teaching is that this won't solve our problems. Just a few chapters earlier in Mark chapter 7, He just taught His disciples that it isn't really a problem of our flesh and our members, but instead our heart. The thing that defiles a person is not the stuff on the outside, but the stuff that comes from the heart. And so as humbling as it would be, if you lopped your hand off, you'd still be a sinner. It wouldn't fix your problem, because it wasn't your hand leading you around to do things against the will of God. kind of frustrating. At least when Jesus says something that's obviously impossible, I don't even have to think about it. But this one, I mean, I could… people have chopped their hands off before. It's, it can be done, but frustratingly, it doesn't solve the heart problem. It doesn't solve what's really going on with us. And you probably noticed if you turned and looked around that the church isn't full of a bunch of one-eyed, one-handed, one-footed people. So clearly, this has not been understood as a literal deal between us and Jesus. We have something far better. And something far better is needed because the nature of the problem is far worse than we think. So then the question is, why would Jesus say this? Now, to understand and make sense of what He really means here, we need to look at a few verses prior in our reading today, verses 40 to 42, and I'll read them for you again. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose His reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in Me to sin it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, at first glance, this seems to be like right in the middle of our gospel reading, two separate unrelated episodes. 
Because what does this have to do with what Jesus is about to say about plucking out an eye or chopping off a hand? Yet they are connected. Jesus, as you'll recall from our past few weeks, has just finished teaching His disciples an important truth about the kingdom of God. There is no one great there. Remember, they were arguing on the way about who was the greatest, and Jesus says, well, what were you talking about? And then they don't want to say, because a part of them knows that it sounded silly and it was wrong. And His answer to them is to bring in front of them a small child. And He says, the kingdom of heaven is for ones such as these. And we learned that he's not just talking about the child, but he's actually teaching his disciples that that is who they are too. Little helpless children at the mercy of God. And so today, when he refers to little ones, he's not talking about literal children. He's talking about them, but he's also talking about you. All those who believe in him. Because it turns out that the kingdom of heaven is made up of God and all of His little ones. There's no one who is great there, only small. Even the twelve disciples are not great, but they are small, just like the child used in the example when he taught them. Now, they forgot the lesson, which we can relate to, right? Jesus has just taught us something profound, and five minutes later, we're doing something that actively works against what we've just been taught. The disciples are part of that group because we're all little children together needing our Lord Jesus. And so they come to Jesus after He's just sort of rebuked them for arguing about who is the greatest, and they try to draw a new distinction. They want the special in-group and the out-group. They're the people who are the real disciples of Jesus, really following Him. And they run into somebody who isn't following after them, but who is casting out demons in the name of Jesus. Now, if you'll recall back earlier in Mark, this is the task that Jesus sent His disciples out to do. And just like in our Old Testament reading, when Joshua is jealous for the sake of Moses, the disciples come and they say, we tried to stop him. Why? Because he wasn't following us. And Jesus patiently, lovingly teaches them once again, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will soon be after, will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Do not stop him. For the one who is not against us is for us. He's on your team, to use the words I spoke in the children's message. Now Moses' response to Joshua is similar with a few key differences. One is that he says even, he goes even further and says, would that it would be the case that God would pour out His Spirit on all of His people so that they would become prophets which fits for the theme of the Old Testament reading because Moses needs help and God gives him help. But it's also different in in the fact that the hope that it expresses is actually fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus doesn't need to have the same response as Moses because it turns out that in Jesus, pouring His Spirit out on all of His people is precisely what He intends to do. There's no outer or inner group. There is one body and one spirit. You're on the same team. There's no greater. There's no lesser. Just a bunch of little ones on team Jesus. Now, verse 41 is where Jesus connects these two sections together. See, Jesus is tying Himself, as He does in many other places in the Scriptures, to these, quote, little ones who believe in Him. The way those who believe in Him are treated 
is the way he is treated. That's what he tells us. One example is in Matthew chapter 10, verse 40. Jesus says, right before the, the sort of similar account in Matthew, he says this, He who receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. So Jesus is telling us that when we're around the little ones who believe in Him, also known as you and me, the believers in Jesus, the stakes are the highest they could possibly be. You are, in fact, interacting with Jesus when you interact with one who believes in Him. The stakes are so high, in fact, that a mundane gesture such as bringing someone a cup of water because of the name of Christ grants an extraordinary reward. But Jesus also emphasizes the stakes in a negative way. If you cause even one of these little ones to sin, it would be better that you drown in the sea, dragged down by a great stone. There's another one of those impossible tasks, and I want to help you really think through why that's impossible. Parents out there, aunts and uncles, grandparents, have you ever caused a little one to sin? Now we're speaking just about the children among us, but now think about, look around the room, your brothers and sisters in Christ here or in the other churches that you're a part of or that you've been in over the years, have you ever caused one of your brothers and sisters in Christ to sin? This stark image of an impossible task with a final and devastating consequence begins a series of strong images depicting the stakes at play when we encounter those who believe in Jesus. Because Jesus has made Himself one with them, little ones who believe in Him. And if that wasn't high enough, the stakes build until we get to verse 48. So you're familiar with the next few verses. If if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off because it would be better for you to go maimed into eternal life than into be cast into hell. And then if you weren't sure exactly what he meant by hell, in verse 48, he clarifies. He says, basically, if you don't succeed in not sinning, that's the whole chopping off of the limbs part, and causing others to sin, the little ones and the millstone, then you will be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. In other words, the consequences are never-ending. It's not a brief punishment to get you to change your mind, but the ultimate eternal consequence of rejecting Jesus. After all, whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Here we are faced again with Jesus holding a bar so impossibly high we cannot hope to reach it. How do we avoid this terrible fate? If the only answer is according to the law, all I can say to you is quit sinning. Stop causing others to sin. And you know as well as I that if that is the answer, we have no hope. It's impossible for us to not sin. It's impossible for us to not cause other little ones who believe in Him to not sin. And perhaps as I speak these words to you, specific instances pop into your mind, a reminder of the shame of your own sin or when you caused others to stumble. Words spoken in anger that brought about in yourself and others doubt and fear and anger in return, failures to help one another out as we ought, which often leads to thoughts of bitterness. Why am I doing so much while they are doing so little? 
We, like the disciples, naturally want to have an in-group and an out-group. It's funny how we're never part of the out-group in that equation. We want to be considered special or great. We want something to distinguish us. Yet, like the disciples, we're taught we're not great. We are small. We are little ones, the little ones who believe in Jesus. And Jesus answers our question regarding how we avoid the terrible fate laid out for those who cannot keep from sinning or causing others to sin. We must be salty. But that brings us back to the original problem, our heart problem, is that we have lost our saltiness. And if someone has lost their saltiness, how can it be restored? Again, another impossible task laid before us. We cannot restore our own saltiness. It is only restored as a little one who has faith in Jesus and not in ourselves, as one who puts aside the idea of being great, of drawing distinctions between one another among the body of Christ. This is why Jesus calls His disciples little ones. That is why He calls you little ones, because of the truth that you and I depend on Him utterly and completely. That's what it means to put yourself at the mercy of another. You no longer have a say in the matter, for there's nothing you can do. You and I, who have no salt in us, must receive it from Him. Dear friends in Christ, I have good news for you. Today, your saltiness has been restored again, just like it was restored last week and the week before, and will be every week until Christ returns. The peace He describes at the end between you has been again reestablished and maintained through the works and deeds of Jesus. That is why once in the service we've actually received the forgiveness of sins, we greet one another. And we don't greet each other stymied by the fear of the stakes of our interaction with the little ones who believe in Jesus. I don't approach you afraid that my actions and deeds might cause you to sin, and thus I'm sent to the torment of hell, nor do you. Nor are we we any longer hampered by the fear of our own sin and what it might mean, for it has been removed. So you and I no longer fear a fate of unending torment, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And the truth of this is represented by the words we speak to one another in that greeting. It's very intentionally chosen to greet one another in the peace of Christ. You're not simply saying, hi, how are you today, or saying it's good to see you. You're expressing the truth of the work of Jesus, that you and the person you greet have had your saltiness restored, and that peace has returned between the two of you and our God in heaven. A peace worked through the deeds of Jesus, who has made His dwelling in us through the gift of the Holy Spirit, and now He brings those divine gifts of God to you each and every time you encounter Him. He has returned to you and given you that which you could not have claimed on your own. He has scaled the bar that was set that we could not hope to reach. And we who have laid ourselves at His mercy, the we little ones who believe in Him, He raises up from death to life, He washes clean from sinners to saints. He restores peace between us. So, my fellow little ones, dear friends in Christ, do not fear the torment that has no end. 
for we have one who has rescued us from that. Do not be afraid that you have no salt in you, for your salt has been restored through the life, death, and resurrection of your Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can meet the end of this reading, the very last verse, not with trepidation or fear, but with joy and confidence. So, dear friends in Christ, I say to you, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. In the name of Jesus, amen.